Uh, right now, I'd invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter number 25. Hopefully you have a Bible that you can look on, and we're going to be reading a, an account here of something in the life of David, 1 Samuel chapter 25. I'd like to read from verse 1 down to verse number 20, and that'll be part of our text here for this morning's message. 1 Samuel chapter 25, beginning in verse number 1, the Bible says, And Samuel died, and all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him, and buried him in his house at Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And there was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel, and the man was very great, and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 3, and goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance, but the man was churlish and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. The men were very good to us, and we were not hurt, neither missed we anything, as long as we were conversant with them when we were in the fields. They were a wall unto us both by night and day, all the while we were with them keeping the sheep. Now therefore know and consider what thou wilt do, for evil is determined against our master and against all his household, for he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine and five sheep ready, to, ready dressed and five measures of parched corn and a hundred clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and laid them on asses. And she said unto her servants, Go on before me, behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband Nabal. And it was so, as she rode on the ass, that she came down by the covert of the hill. And behold, David and his men came down against her, and she met them. Well, we'll stop it there, but uh, you can see that this is an interesting story in the life of David. And uh, it's a, an account that takes place during the period of time that David was a fugitive from King Saul. Uh, this is after David had slain Goliath and had uh, helped Israel in many ways, but King Saul, who was a very jealous king, a, a man who was tormented by an evil spirit and had moods of melancholy, eventually he hated David and began to hunt him and David had to flee. And so now for about six years, David has been on the run and uh, with his men, uh, a motley crew of men who uh, came from all uh, parts of life and, and now they were David's faithful and loyal men, about 600 of them. And, uh, and so that brings us to the account here in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 25. Now as we read this, you would have noticed that there are three main characters in the story. Now, first of all, there is a man by the name of Nabal. Uh, that word, by the way, means fool. I don't know why his parents would have called him that, but uh, maybe they could sense or see something in his life. But uh, that's what the word Nabal means. He was a fool. And certainly we can see from his actions here that uh, he certainly was. In fact, the Bible describes him as churlish. And that word simply means crude or very surly. He was not a man that you wanted to be with. Uh, he was a man who was uh, just uh, uh, someone who was a bear to be around, I guess we would put it that way. Then there is Abigail, his wife, and uh, the Bible describes her as someone who is very beautiful, but more than that, on the outside, she is a very wise and understanding woman. And our message this morning is really going to focus on Abigail. But uh, then the third character is David. And uh, David, of course, has been already anointed by Samuel, the prophet, to be the next king. Uh, Saul had disobeyed God and his rebellion cost him 
the dynasty, the kingship, and so uh, God said, I'll find a man after my own heart, and David was God's choice. But uh, there's a long time before uh, he actually becomes the king. And uh, sometimes that happens in our life, doesn't it? When we know God wants something for us, he has a plan for us, but many times it takes a while before that comes to fruition. God is using that. We sang a song about how God will use the trials of life uh, to prepare us and we'll come forth as gold. We're not always ready to, to do what God wants us to do. And David had to go through the crucible uh, of uh, affliction and persecution, uh, but uh, it taught him to trust God more and it brought him out as, a, as a, one of the great kings of Israel. Of course, he's uh, uh, esteemed even to this day. Uh, it's interesting in the previous chapter that uh, the Lord had put David to a test when he and his men were hiding in the wilderness and they were holed up in a large cave at En Gedi. And uh, they were inside the cave because Saul and his soldiers were roaming around the countryside looking for them. And as it turned out, Saul went into the cave. And uh, David's men said, wow, God has brought you the great opportunity here. Uh, you can kill him and uh, then you will be uh, the king. This is how you can take care of things. Again, we can learn a lesson there, can't we? Because sometimes we're so anxious to, to do what God has for us to do and we're not willing to wait on the Lord. And David did have an opportunity. In fact, the narrative in the previous chapter says that uh, he came and, and, and uh, secretly uh, cut off a, the bottom part of Saul's robe. And later when Saul was outside, David was there waving it, saying, look, I could have killed you. But David learned a lesson there. We see there in verse number 12 of chapter 24, uh, David decided that he would not take matters into his own hand. He knew that God had a plan for his life. He knew that God was working in his life. But he was wanting to let God do it. And so in verse 12, David said, The Lord judged between me and thee, and the Lord avenge me of thee, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. That was a big test for David because he had an opportunity, but it would have been an opportunity of the flesh rather than of the spirit. And so we find that David had learned a lesson to let God take care of the problems in his life. But now we come to chapter 25 and uh, we see that as uh, David sends some of his men uh, to Nabal to ask for uh, some provisions. Uh, remember David was a fugitive. He had to, uh, he had to live off the, um, the gifts of the people. Uh, and when his men came to Nabal, uh, he, uh, he insulted them, he humiliated them by refusing to give them anything. And uh, so uh, this uh, had a, a negative effect uh, when David uh, heard about that. In fact, he, he basically, he lost his temper. Uh, David became very, very angry. If you look at verse number 13, and David said unto his men, gird ye on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword. And David also girded on his sword. And there went up after David about 400 men, 200 abode by the stuff. I mean, David was so angry with his men being rejected and humiliated that uh, he was going to take uh, matters into his own hands once again. And in a fit of anger, he was going to uh, not only kill Nabal, but he was going to kill every, every uh, worker there, all of the shepherds, all of the shearers, any man who worked for Nabal he was going to, to completely destroy. And, uh, and you know, this, uh, this offense by Nabal uh, was an offense. If you look back into the book of Deuteronomy, uh, just uh, turn back there if you can. Uh, I'll read these scriptures from the 15th chapter. But the law prescribed that uh, if you had an abundance, you were to be benevolent. Uh, this is something I think that has come over into New Testament teaching, the teaching of our Lord. It is better to give than to receive. And if God has blessed us as New Testament believers, then we also ought to be giving. But this was the Old Testament law, 
in Deuteronomy 15, verse 7, the Bible says, If there be among you a poor man, any one of thy brethren with any, uh, within any of thy gates in thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thine heart, nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother, but thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wanteth. Now that was the law that God had given to the Israelites, and this was the law that Nabal didn't care about. (laughs) He wasn't going to do that. He wasn't going to follow what God had said. And so there was a tremendous offence taken by David. Uh, He didn't just shrug his shoulders and say, well, I guess uh, we won't go and ask Nabal again. We'll just go find someone else. No, he got angry. Uh, He got so angry that uh, uh, he uh, got 400 of his men armed up. They put on all their weapons and they were going to go and just take care of Nabal and his family. Uh, You know, there's a problem when we get angry, isn't there? Uh, anger can easily cause us to sin. Uh, now, there may be such a thing as righteous anger, anger and indignation over sin, but uh, getting angry is a problem, and it was a problem here for David. Uh, when, we, when we get angry, many times we'll say something we shouldn't say or we'll do something we shouldn't do. And David's anger was that he was going to massacre not only Nabal, but he was going to massacre uh, an innocent family. That would have been a sin that was far greater than the insult that uh, Nabal had given. And certainly for David, in his situation, if you think about it, it would have destroyed the goodwill that he enjoyed with the local population. You see, what was happening is that while David was on the run as a fugitive, he and, and his men... Uh, employed themselves in protecting the flocks and the possessions of the uh, various towns and villages and settlements that were there scattered throughout uh, the Judean hills. And so the people appreciated David. Uh, As a matter of fact, uh, uh, what the young men said uh, in verse um, number 16 of David's men, they were a wall unto us both by night and day, all the while we were with them keeping the sheep. And so David had uh, a great amount of goodwill and this was essential for God's plan in his life when he would become king that he would have people who would love him and follow him because they knew of his character. But you see, anger could destroy that and it could have destroyed David and his testimony in just one afternoon had he carried out uh, this uh, attack. The book of Proverbs, chapter 14, verse number 17 says, He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly. And uh, you, you know what we're told, uh, uh, you know, if you get angry, count up to ten, do things like that. Uh, we, we need to be aware that uh, if we fly off the handle, if you have a problem with anger, uh, you, you need to ask God and the Holy Spirit to control you uh, with spiritual control so that you don't just do and say rash things. Uh, We could put it this way, walk softly, speak tenderly, and pray fervently. Now, our sympathies might be with David. We might say, well, he had every right. I mean, Nabal had disobeyed God's command. Nabal had humiliated his men by turning them away. And, uh, you know, we'd say, well, if I was David, I I could understand that. I'd want to take matters into my own hands as well. But you know, even though we may, uh, we may have sympathy toward that situation, as Christians, our hearts and our obedience must be with Jesus Christ and uh, not, uh, not to just react in the flesh. And uh, so we find that as David is preparing to do this, that Abigail, the wife of Nabal, uh, intervenes. And really, in this passage of Scripture, this chapter... Abigail would be the star of the chapter. Why? Well, first of all, she saved her husband's neck and she saved all of the young men that he had in his employ as shearers and shepherds and farmhands. She saved their life. That was a great thing. 
but also she saved David and his testimony because had David carried out that plot, his testimony would have been shot and who knows what would have happened. So Abigail really is the, is the, the highlight of this particular chapter and so what I'd like to speak on for a few moments here is I, I call this uh, the blessing of a good woman the blessing of a good woman. You know, I can only speak for myself, but I'll tell you, there's been times in our marriage when my wife has saved me from uh, all kinds of situations. And maybe you can say the same. Uh, You men who are married, you would say, yeah, there were times when my wife uh, said things and, 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 and cautioned me or gave me a warning or maybe gave me some perspective on life or a situation that I haven't seen. Thank God for a woman who will help that, uh, her husband in that, in that particular way. Because, yeah, that's what the Bible says, that a wife is a help meet for her husband. She is someone that is there to complete him and, and to be there by his side. And, uh, and there are times when our wives can really help us. If you look at verse number 33, this is what David said to Abigail, verse 32 David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet me. And notice this, and blessed be thy advice. Blessed be thy advice. Now I'll tell you, when a man or a husband says, I, I don't listen to my wife, uh, she, she really, I'll just do it my way and we're bullheaded. <laughs> uh, we're probably going to end for, uh, head for some, uh, some hard times in our life. Uh, We ought to be thankful for our wife. We ought to be thanking God and blessing our wife for the advice that they can give from time to time. So let's look at this um, Abigail. You know, she was the wife of Nabal, the fool, and uh, and yet the Bible describes her in verse number 3 as a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. But the man was churlish and evil in his doings. So here is a woman who obviously is one of great character, um, married to a drunken boar. (laughs) And, uh, you know, it's a sad thing, but um, uh, there's a lot of marriages that are in that kind of situation. Now, I'm not here preaching about anyone I know of here in this church, Uh, But we know out there in the world there's a lot of unhappy marriages. Uh, Sometimes it's, uh, and it's not all the man's fault, but sometimes and many times it is where the husband, uh, like uh, Nabal, cares nothing for God's word. Uh, He would have known the the commandment that uh, when, when you have been blessed, you're to share that blessing to those that have need. He knew that, I'm sure, but he didn't care about what God's word had to say. Um, uh, he, uh, he was involved in his own world. Uh, and so as far as his wife was concerned, uh, she was someone he could use. He didn't really love his wife like he, a husband should. Uh, he was a man who was always right. <laughs> Uh, verse number 17, even his workers said this, the latter, latter part of verse 17, he is a man that ca- you, you cannot, a man cannot speak to him. You ever met someone like that? You just, you want to talk to somebody, but they're so adamant that they're right, you're wrong, and they're not going to listen to anything that you would say. You just can't speak to someone like that. Well, this was the kind of husband that, Na- uh, that Abigail had. Why would she marry such a man? Why would she do that? Well, we don't know. Uh, But I'll tell you what, uh, one thing about Nabal, he was a very wealthy man. And some young ladies, I think they they feel like, well, if I can marry into money, life will be great. Well, not always. And uh, I'm not saying this is what Abigail did, but if she did, uh, she married into a lot of wealth. He was very wealthy. But the marriage was very, very unhappy. An unhappy marriage. Um, you know, this, this Naboth character, I, I just envisage him as the kind of husband who would come home drunk every night, maybe beat up on his wife a little bit, 
Uh, he, would, he was a, a husband. He was the kind of husband that would say, if you want to go to church, you take the kids. You go. I'm not going to church. Uh, he would be the kind of husband who would, uh, uh, you know, just uh, have no spiritual interest in his family at all. Uh, he was probably one of the poorest examples of a husband that we would find in the word of God. And yet he was married to this beautiful woman who was in her own right a spiritual woman, very, very wise and understanding. He dishonored his family name. Did you notice there that uh, the Bible says in the latter part of verse number three that Naboth was of the house of Caleb? Well, Caleb was one of the famous characters in the Old Testament. Remember Joshua and Caleb? They were the two spies who, with the other ten, went into the promised land of Canaan they all came back with a glowing report, but 10 of the spies says, said, we, we can't go into the land because there's giants and we're just like grasshoppers in their sight. And it was Joshua and Caleb who said, but God is on our side and we can go in and win. Well, they wanted to stone them. They took a stand for truth. And then 40 years later, as Joshua is dividing up the land, Caleb is an 80-year-old man he says, I want that mountain. And the Bible says three times there in Joshua chapter 14 that Caleb wholly followed the Lord. Well, not so his distant relative, Nabal. He was of the house of Caleb, but he dishonored his family name. And here is the situation of this wife who is living in what we would call a bad marriage. And you know, what's a woman to do when those situations come? Uh, sometimes as a pastor, we, we have to give counsel where a marriage is going through a hard time. And I'll tell you one thing, God hates divorce. It's never God's will that a couple would divorce. And a lot of times that's where it heads, up, heads to and ends up, but that's not the will of God. And uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult sometimes to give advice and help to a wife in that situation. But one thing any woman can do, even in a bad marriage, is that she can always keep her soul clean and pure. She can still live her life for the Lord. It's not easy. It's very, very difficult. But if God would help and God will help, she can prove the grace and power of the Lord and be strengthened and kept pure. You know, God has a promise, I think, in this situation. This is found in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection uh, to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, <laughs> that's Nabal, if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Well, what does that mean? The, co the conversation of the wives means the lifestyle. And if a, if a woman has a, a so-called bad marriage where the husband is abusive or where the husband is, has no interest in the things of God, it doesn't mean to say that she's got to respond in kind. She can still live a godly life before her husband and trust the Lord to touch his heart and to change his heart and to bring him to the place of salvation. Because that's what every man needs, is to be saved. Well, Abigail faced a real dilemma here. When she was told that David is coming, and he's coming with 400 men, and they are all armed to the teeth, and he's going to come and kill everybody, what would, what would she do? Would she... Uh, she could have gone to her husband, Nabal, and said, well, he's coming, and what would have happened? Well, Nabal, Nabal, knowing his character, he would have blown up and she would have felt the brunt of his wrath because she would be seen as taking sides. So it was real difficult to go to her husband. Uh, she could say nothing, but uh, then she would just stand by and watch all of the men being massacred. That wouldn't be a good thing. She could go to David, he was an angry man who was seething, ready to come and wreak revenge, she'd have to face his blind anger. 
So what was she to do? Uh, you know, if you, and I speak both to men and women here. Have you ever found yourself in a kind of situation where all of your options don't seem to be very good? And uh, that happens a lot in life, especially with major things. And if I do this, then that's probably going to happen. If I do this, then this won't happen and so forth. What do we do when we're faced with those kinds of situations? Well, here's where the message is. I want, to, want you to see what Abigail did. And there is, there's a number of steps that she took. I would say this is great instruction for wives, but really in a general sense it would apply to us as well. The first thing she did was she immediately went into action. Look at verse number 18. Uh, after she has heard what is going to take place, then Abigail made haste. She didn't sit around and say, well, I can't really do much about it. I mean, she took steps. She actually went into action and she came up with a plan. The second thing that we see she did is she didn't tell her husband. Now, you might say, well, hey, she's supposed to be in subjection to her husband and now she's going behind her husband's back. Is that a good thing? Well, not always, unless it's for a birthday gift or some nice surprise that you've got for your husband, but uh, normally there shouldn't be secrets between a husband and wife. Uh, there should be an open flow of conversation. But the Bible says in verse 19, but she told not her husband Nabal. But think about this. The actions that she did take in going to David and defusing that situation, she really had her husband's best interests in mind. And I think that's the mark of a godly wife, that she is not living for herself but for her husband and she wants the very best for him. And that, that certainly was what um, Abigail had here uh, for her husband. It wouldn't have done to go to him. It would have just worsened the situation. Perhaps he would have armed all of his servants and there would be a ding-dong battle with casualties on every side and nothing would be resolved. So she took action right away uh, and then uh, she did things that would ultimately protect her husband. Number three, she came to David who was very angry but she approached him with humility. Look at verse 23. And when Abigail saw David, she hasted and lighted off the ass and fell before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground. It's very interesting what she did. She had a very submissive approach. And, uh, you know, as, uh, for, for wives who are instructed to be submitting to their husbands, um, you know, what does this submission really mean? Well, there's, there's different kinds of submission. Uh, there's silent submission where the wife just simply shuts up and doesn't say anything. That's not really being submissive, but that's one kind of submission. On the other hand, there's the sharp speaking sub submission uh, where the wife feels it's her God-ordained job to criticize and correct everything about her husband. Well, there's also the sweet speaking submission, which is the appeal to authority. Now, David was a man in authority as the future king of Israel. This woman, this relatively unknown woman, came to prevent David from advancing and, and, uh, and, and killing people. Her approach in submitting to David was great humility. But it's interesting that she called David her Lord, L-O-R-D, her master 13 times and she was recognizing his authority and showing her submission to that authority. So she approached with humility. As Christians when we are dealing with different difficult situations humility is going to be a very important commodity. Number four she asked to speak in verse 24 and she fell upon his feet and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this iniquity be. And let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience and hear the words of thine handmaid. Uh, this, this, this Abigail was not a brawling woman. You know what I mean by a brawling woman? 
Proverbs 21 verse 9 says it's better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. Uh, she didn't come at David like a, an angry bee and, uh, and just attack David and, 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 and all of those things. The Bible says that she came in humility and she requested permission to speak. Um, she asked to speak. Uh, but then she acted as an intercessor. Uh, we talk about intercessory prayer. And uh, intercessory prayer is where you, as the, pr as the prayer warrior, are standing between uh, a problem and someone who is affected by that problem. Uh, we often use intercessory prayer in praying for missionaries and those that are preaching the gospel. Uh, they are there in a foreign country, let's say, and, and they're facing opposition or obstacles in their ministry. Uh, we are standing between them praying to the, go to the Lord in heaven uh, on their behalf, on his behalf. And uh, this is what Abigail did. She acted as an intercessor. Look at verse 24 again. She said, I pray thee, speak, uh, let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience and hear the words of thine handmaid. Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord whom thou didst send. So uh, here she is, as uh, she's standing between Nabal's men and David's men. She put herself in that situation. And so the way that we would approach uh, a situation or uh, an issue of conflict, the way that we deal with that, when we have conflict in our marriages between husband and wife, when, when there's a, a, a difference of opinion, it doesn't help for anyone, husband or wife, just to get all upset about it and begin a shouting match. It doesn't get anywhere. But there needs to be humility and then... Uh, an approach that will uh, be a, a calming approach. And this is what uh, Abigail did when she came to David. But here's the thing that really helped, and I want you to see this. She refocused David's thoughts. His thoughts were just, he was so blind with rage, was just killing people, as many as he could. She refocused his thinking uh, onto God. Verse 28 she said, I, I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord, and evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. You know, seven times she brings up the name of the Lord. If you're looking at that in your Bibles, it's the capitalized spelling, okay? L-O-R-D. When it's capitalized, that's the translators telling us that that is the name of God, Jehovah, and they've translated it that way. So she's referring to David as her Lord, L-O-R-D, small letters, as her master. She's submitting to David, but now she is reminding David of the Lord. And she's reminding David of the promises of God. That certainly helps when we have conflict, when we have difficult situations. You see, Abigail is a woman of faith, meaning that she believed the promises of God. Look at um, verse number 29. Yet a man is risen to pursue thee and to seek thy soul, but the soul of my Lord, David, shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord, Jehovah, thine God. And the souls of thine enemies, them shall he sling out as out of the middle of a sling. Why is she saying those words, do you think? Because she's reminding David that you brought down Goliath with a sling. And it wasn't you, David, it was God who directed that stone right into his forehead. David, you don't need to take care of Nabal and his men. God will take care of that. You just need to do what is right. And she is reminding David of who his God is, getting his focus from off the problem, but onto God who can uh, deal with that problem in a proper way. 
David was taking out four, his 400 men to do what God could do as easily as throwing a stone out of a sling. <laughs> but notice that she didn't beat David down. She didn't come and say, David, you're a fool. David, what are you up to? You're crazy. She didn't come at David like that. She was very respectful. Um, and, and she affirmed that David was God's choice. She reminded him of what God had in plan. Look at verse 30. And it shall come to pass, this is Abigail speaking, it shall come to pass when the Lord, capitalized, shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he hath spoken concerning thee and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel. She's saying God is going to do what he said he will do. And David, you don't have to take matters into your own hands. And she didn't beat David down, but she lifted him up. And by the way, wives, that's what your husbands need. A man's basic need is to have affirmation. He needs that affirmation. And you as a wife have a great role to play in affirming your husband's role and God's role in your husband's life. There are times when we men... We lose sight of that. We forget that God has a plan and a purpose for our life and, and we fret and we fuss and, boy, it's so nice to have a wife who come and just remind you of the promises of God. Well, that's what Abigail did. She was a woman of great faith. And notice that, really, she did, as we did Queen Esther, she appealed to authority. And the Bible says in Proverbs 25, verse 1, by long forbearing is a prince persuaded and a soft tongue breaketh the bone. Um, it's, that, it's those uh, soft words that are righteous words, that are uh, uh, good scripture, scripture-based words that is going to help in these situations. When Esther, think of the story of Esther just for a moment. She was also in a situation uh, there in Persia where... Haman had engineered the imminent destruction of all the Jews. And Esther was a Jew. And uh, the only way that she could uh, deal with this was to approach the king, her husband. But in those days, uh, being the king and having a queen wasn't quite like a marriage we would expect. So the first thing that Esther did was she got all the Jews praying. She said, let's get down on our knees and pray to the God of heaven. And then as she approached the king, she respectfully approached the king. He had signed the, the order to kill. And finally she came in and touched that royal scepter. And she then waited. A couple of meals later, she finally broached the subject. Very, very wise in her appeal to authority. Abigail waited for the right time to speak to her husband. In verse number 36, Abigail came to Nabal and behold, he held a feast in his house like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him for he was very drunken. Wherefore she told him nothing less or more until the morning light. Now she, she was a wise wife. She waited till the right time came to, to actually talk to him about this. I, I would say as just a, a practical thing wives when your husband walks in the door coming home from work that's usually not the time to hit him up with all your problems uh, unless there's a dire life-changing emergency and if that is hang up and dial 911 right <laughs> well I'm only kidding there but you know a, a husband when he comes home from a busy day's work uh, wait wait a little while before you start going through the problems with the children, the problems with the house, or any other problems you have, uh, give him time to, to relax and, and, well, in this case, get over his hangover with Nabal before she actually spoke to him. A bit of wisdom there, I think, in uh, how we approach. And, and this, of course, is, is in other situations in life as well. But Esther did something nice. She made a banquet for her husband. Uh, she had his favorite meal. That's the soft tongue that can eventually break the bone of the prince. And then she trusted the Lord to move. Um, 
You know, as husbands, let me say that we ought to encourage our wives to speak. Um, don't ever reinforce the idea of silent submission. Well, my wife just needs to keep her mouth shut. I'm not interested in anything she has to say. I, know, I don't think that anyone would do that, but uh, our wives have so much wisdom and they can be such a blessing. And then when your wife does come and, and she, she doesn't just say, husband, you're wrong, I'm right, but she might say, husband, have you ever thought about this? Instead of just uh, dismissing it, carefully and prayerfully receive what your wife has to say. Think about what she's saying. You know, I talked about a husband's basic need is to be affirmed that he's the man. A wife's basic need is to be needed, that she has value. And husbands, when you listen to your wife and give her the attention that she really deserves, you are saying, sweetheart, you have value to me. I value your opinion. I value your thoughts. That's going to be a, uh, a, a way to, to really have a happy marriage. And as husbands, we also need to recognize there are times when God speaks to us through our wives. And uh, sometimes we're just too proud to accept that, but the fact is our wives can have a lot of wisdom. And when they do help us, make sure we tell them, thank you, honey, you saved me from embarrassment there. Or you saved me from getting into a real financial mess. Thank you for your wisdom. Well, Abigail, she exhibits these qualities. She was in a, a very unhappy marriage. Uh, her husband, I mean, she would have been, uh, she should have gotten a medal just to stay with him, I would say. And, uh, you know, David was a man who was bent on taking care of Nabal as a reaction to his hot anger. But, you know, God has a, a better way. And we see that in verse 36 through 39. Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he held a feast in his house, like the feast of a king, and Nabal's hut was merry within him, for he was very drunken, wherefore she told him nothing, less or more, until the morning light. But it came to pass in the morning, when the wine was gone out of Nabal, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. And it came to pass about ten days after that the Lord smote Nabal that he died. Now God took care of that problem. God can do things. Now I'm not saying that, <laughs> that he's going to kill every husband that uh, uh, you know, just uh, acts not in the way that God would have. But I do believe that if we will commit our way to the Lord as wives and as husbands in our marriages, we'll see God work. And God did work in this situation. Uh, God prevented through the wise, uh, humble intervention of this, wo this woman, Abigail, God worked in that situation and then God showed himself, I can take care of these problems. I hope that that gives some hope to all of us because uh, we're all prone to wanting to take care of things ourselves, aren't we? We, we? we have our own plan and our own way of doing things. And the Bible says, commit your way unto the Lord and he will bring these things to pass. If we'll just put God there in the center. And sometimes we need that refocusing. David certainly needed it. And praise God for this courageous, godly woman who came to David when he was fit to be tied and as mad as anything and she was able to get through and, and speak sense and, and scripture sense to David. And God not only took care of the problem but God had another plan it seems uh, in verse 42 and Abigail hasted and arose and rode upon an ass with five damsels of hers that went after her and she went after the messengers of David and became his wife. So uh, uh, an unexpected beginning, uh, ending I should say, an unexpected ending when you consider how things were just a, a few days earlier. Uh, God is an amazing God. Now, I'm not saying that he's going to you know, give you another uh, wife or another husband, things like that. But, uh, you know, the principles that we're trying to see here I think are important. Uh, and and the, the faith of Abigail in, in knowing what God had promised David 
uh, knowing that God would take care of things in his time and talking biblical sense to David and reminding him of what God had already promised. David, you don't have to step in and take over and do what God said he would do. Remember, remember the, the account of Abraham. Uh, when he was 75 years of age, God promised him a son who would become part of that Abrahamic covenant. 75 years of age, wow. But you know what? God waited till he was 99 before he got a son. But in the meantime, Abraham got a little concerned about it. Where's this son of promise? And finally, his wife came and said, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you go into the handmaid, Hagar, have a child with her, and I'll bring it up, and it'll be the son. You see, when he took his eyes off the Lord, he started doing things according to human reasoning. And Ishmael was born, and today we still deal with that, ish that problem. But uh, God came through in the end, and 99 years of age to have a child, wow. Old enough to be grandpa or great-grandpa, but, you know, God does wonderful things. And if we would learn that lesson from this account here, I think it would be a great help to all of us. Abigail was a woman of faith. What does that mean, to be a woman of faith? Well, if I can bring it into New Testament terminology today, it means that she was saved. You know, we talk a lot about being saved. That simply means that we who are sinners, all of us are sinners, and the wages of sin is death, and we all face an eternity facing the second death, which is to be cast into the lake of fire. But the good news is that Jesus Christ came into this world. He died on the cross, and as one who had never sinned, he took all of our sins upon himself. And there, hung between heaven and earth, our Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins. He paid the penalty in full for our sins. And then he rose again, proving that his offering, his sacrifice had been received by heaven and that through his life we can now have the gift of eternal life. And so the gospel is that Christ died for our sins. He was buried, but he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that through him we can have eternal life. And I believe that Abigail was a believer. There were... Uh, she, she knew the promises of God and she acted upon them. That's what we Christians do or should do is we live by faith. Faith is simply taking God at his word and that will affect everything we do. And so here is an example of a great woman in the Bible, a woman of faith, Abigail. And I would say we can take a lesson of the blessings of a good woman. I hope that you can say that, men, as you think, and those of you who are married, that you can think of your wife in that term, that she is a good woman. And yes, there have been times when she's saved my neck, and I thank God for her. Hopefully you'll let her know that. And then all of us can take a lesson in how we deal with problems, not to take it in upon ourselves to uh, solve those problems without first consulting the great problem solver, our Lord Jesus Christ. Because God has a, a better way most times. And uh, when we follow the Lord, we'll see those great results. Well, I hope that that was uh, a blessing and encouragement to you today. Now, let's stand with our heads bowed for a moment. We'll prepare to finish our meeting here with a song. And uh, um, if, if uh, let me just say this for the benefit of uh, everyone that's here, if, if uh, uh, you are wondering about this idea of faith and what it means to be saved, um, we're always concerned enough to take the time to show you from the Bible how you can be saved uh, because the Bible is given to us for that purpose. The, the Gospel of John says that these things are written that you may know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know for sure that you're saved and it would be our pleasure to, to help you with that and all you have to do is let it, let it be known. We'll, we'll be glad to do that.